This is the fourth video in a series where I cover everything you need to know to build a GPS receiver from scratch. In the previous video, we learned how to distinguish signals from different satellites and how to decode bits from those signals. However, in order to actually do that, we need to be able to access those signals in code. The process of measuring signals over time is called sampling, and that's what we'll be covering in this video. More specifically, we'll talk about the hardware you need to sample GPS signals, how to configure that hardware with parameters like central frequency, bandwidth, and sampling rate, and the form of the data that the hardware will produce, namely IQ samples. Let's start with the hardware. The radio waves transmitted by GPS satellites are analog. In order to access them in code, we need to digitize them. To do that, we use a software-defined radio dongle, or an SDR dongle. On one side, it connects to an antenna, and on the other side, your computer. Based on how you configure it, it periodically measures the signal from the antenna and sends those measurements to your computer. There are a bunch of different ones you can use, but in my case, I have an RTL SDR. As a quick demonstration, here I've tuned it to an FM radio station, and I can use this software, SDR++, to listen to it on my computer. The visualization at the top here shows the frequency of signals we're receiving on the horizontal axis and their strength on the vertical axis. You can see we have a strong signal in the middle here, which is the radio station we're listening to. Then on either side, there's a gap and another strong signal. These are other radio stations on different frequencies. To listen to FM radio, I was using a dipole or rabbit ear antenna as shown in this image here. But to receive GPS signals, we need a special antenna, like this one. It's built specifically for GPS frequencies, to minimize noise, as GPS signals are quite weak, and it has a hemispherical reception pattern, which means it can receive signals from anywhere above it. That's important when you consider a satellite could be anywhere in the sky. With those two things, that's all the hardware we need. But to use them to receive a signal, we need to configure three parameters the center frequency, the bandwidth, and the sampling rate. So what's the center frequency? Let's go back to the FM radio to demonstrate. The center frequency is the frequency you've tuned the radio to, just like in your car. You can see that as we increase the center frequency, the signals move to the left as we move up the frequency spectrum. Eventually, we lose the radio station we were listening to, and if we increase it enough, we eventually get to the next radio station. It's just like turning the knob in your car. In the previous video, we decided to use the CA signal, which is broadcast on the L1 frequency at 1575.42 MHz. So that's the center frequency we'll use. Next, we need to choose a bandwidth. Looking at the FM radio again, even though we say radio stations transmit on a single frequency, like tuned to 106.5, they actually span a band of frequencies, and we need to sample all of them to get the full signal. This band is a result of the modulation process, and its width is surprisingly called the bandwidth. So what's the bandwidth of the CA signal? Well, we know that the satellite computes the exclusive OR of its navigation message and the PRN code, then modulates the result onto the carrier wave using binary phase shift keying, or BPSK. If we were to graph a BPSK modulated signal on a power versus frequency graph, we'd get something like this. You can see that the signal's power has been spread over a range of frequencies, but most of it is contained in that main lobe in the middle. If we were to only sample that main lobe, we'd still capture most of the signal's power. It turns out that the width of this main lobe is equal to twice the data rate of the modulation signal. In our case, the data rate of the modulation signal is equal to the data rate of the PRN code, 1.023 megabits per second. Twice that is 2.046 megahertz, so that's the bandwidth we'll use. Finally, we need to choose a sampling rate, the number of samples we take per second. As we just discussed, the CA signal has a center frequency of around 1.6 gigahertz. That means it oscillates around 1.6 billion times per second. If we choose a sampling rate lower than this, we may not capture all of the information within the signal. On the other hand, if we choose one significantly higher, it could become computationally expensive and produce more data than we need. So how do we choose? Thankfully, 
The Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem tells us that if the maximum frequency contained within a signal is f max, then the signal can be determined from its samples if the sampling rate is greater than 2 f max. In other words, if our sampling rate is greater than two times the maximum frequency within the signal, we'll capture all of its information. In the case of the CA signal, we can calculate the maximum frequency as the center frequency plus half the bandwidth. Substituting in the actual values, we find that gives us a maximum frequency of around 1.6 GHz. The Nyquist rate is double that, or around 3.2 GHz. Unfortunately, my SDR dongle has a maximum sampling rate of 3.2 MHz, which is a thousand times less than this, so that's not going to work. What are we going to do? Well, what actually happens if we sample below the Nyquist rate? Maybe it's not as bad as we think. Let's consider a 4 Hz signal. At the top here is an amplitude versus time graph, and at the bottom is a power versus frequency graph, the same as we saw in the FM radio visualization, showing which frequencies are present. The Nyquist rate for this signal is 8 Hz. If we sample at a rate below that, say 2 Hz, we get these samples. Obviously the 4 Hz signal fits these samples, but so do 2 and 0 Hz signals, as you can see here. It seems that when we sample below the Nyquist rate, the samples we get could have been produced by the original signal or certain lower frequency signals. They're indistinguishable. These lower frequency signals are called aliases, and their frequencies can be predicted by taking the frequency of the original signal and subtracting integer multiples of the sampling rate. In this case, that would be 4 minus integer multiples of 2, giving aliases at 2 and 0 Hz, as we can observe. If we change the sampling rate, we get different aliases. For example, a sampling rate of 1 Hz would result in aliases at 3, 2, 1, and 0 Hz. As I drag this slider, you can see that higher sampling rates result in fewer aliases whose frequencies are further apart, and lower sampling rates result in more aliases whose frequencies are closer together. All of this applies to the CA signal too. The main difference is that it occupies a band of frequencies rather than a single frequency. This is another power versus frequency graph, this time showing bands of frequencies. You can imagine the rightmost one is the original CA signal, and those to the left are its aliases when we sample below the Nyquist rate. You can see that if our sampling rate is too low, the bands can overlap. For reasons that I won't go into, we don't want that to happen. That means the sampling rate needs to be greater than the signal's bandwidth of 2.046 MHz, at which point they just avoid overlapping. Okay, so how does all of this help us choose a sampling rate? Well, I said earlier that the samples of the original signal and those of the aliases are indistinguishable. They contain exactly the same information. It's as if we're sampling the original signal shifted to a lower frequency. If we choose our sampling rate carefully, there'll be an alias centered at 0 Hz. A signal of frequency 0 Hz is constant, so that's like replacing the carrier wave of the signal with a constant. This alias will contain the same information and have the same bandwidth as the original signal, but it'll have a much lower Nyquist rate, hopefully low enough for our SDR dongle. This is the technique I mentioned during the CDMA proof in the previous video, and it's called band pass sampling, or undersampling. So, is there a sampling rate that meets all of these requirements? Yes, 2.046 MHz. It's large enough that the aliases don't overlap in frequency space. It's 1 770th of the L1 frequency, so it results in an alias at 0 Hz. And the maximum frequency of that alias is 1.023 MHz, so its Nyquist rate is 2.046 MHz, exactly the same value as the sampling rate, and it's within the capability of our SDR dongle. Ideally, we'd sample at a slightly higher rate to give ourselves a bigger margin for error, but this should still work. Okay, we have our hardware, we've chosen our center frequency, our bandwidth, and our sampling rate, and now we can sample GPS signals. Each sample provided by our SDR dongle is a pair of numbers called the in-phase and quadrature components, or IQ components of the signal. You may have expected each sample to be a single number representing the amplitude of the signal at the time of measurement. While samples can take that form, 
With IQ values, it's much easier to determine the phase of the signal, which is useful when BPSK modulation uses the phase to encode bits. Let me show you what IQ values represent. Say the signal we're sampling has a fixed frequency, but its amplitude and phase can vary in time, much like a GPS signal. Let's define it like this, where A of t is the amplitude at time t, f is the frequency, and phi of t is the phase at time t. We can use this trigonometric identity to split the cosine term, like so. We can use another trigonometric identity to replace one of the sine terms with a cosine term. And finally, if we do a little rearranging and introduce the terms i of t and q of t, we get the final expression. What this shows is that the original expression, a wave with arbitrary amplitude and phase, can be expressed as the sum of two cosine terms, one of which has a phase offset of pi over 2, or 90 degrees. If you haven't already guessed, these are the i and q values of our samples, i being the in-phase component and q being the quadrature, or 90 degree phase component. So how do we use iq values to determine a signal's phase? Well, if we divide q by i, we get the following. The a of t terms cancel, leaving the tangent of the phase. If we take the inverse tangent of both sides, we get the phase of the signal. This looks very similar to the equation for calculating the angle of a right-angled triangle, which suggests we should try plotting IQ values in Cartesian coordinates. On the left here, we have an IQ plot. The horizontal axis is the I-axis, and the vertical axis is the Q-axis. On the right, we have an amplitude versus time graph. The location of the point on the IQ plot determines the I and Q values, which in turn determine the signal. On the right, the blue wave is the in-phase cosine term, the orange wave is the quadrature phase cosine term, and the green wave is their sum. If I drag the point so it lies on the i-axis, there's only an in-phase contribution. If it's on the q-axis, there's only quadrature phase. As I continue to drag the point around, you can see that its angle from the positive i-axis determines the phase of the signal, as we just found, and its distance from the origin determines the amplitude which you can prove using the Pythagorean theorem. The graph on the left is called a constellation diagram, and it'll be very useful to help debug our GPS receiver. I mentioned earlier that BPSK modulation changes the phase of the carrier wave by 180 degrees to encode binary zeros and ones. We now know that on this diagram, that looks like a rotation of 180 degrees. For example, if a zero was here, a one would be here. You can see that as I move them around, they continue to mirror each other. Eventually, our goal will be to transform the received signal so these points lie on the i-axis. If that's the case, we can use the sign of their i-coordinates to distinguish them. However, in practice, that's not enough to know which corresponds to a 0 and which to a 1. For example, say we receive this IQ sample. You can see it makes an angle of 45 degrees with the positive i-axis. It could represent a 0 with a phase of 45 degrees, but it could also represent a 1 with a phase of negative 135 degrees. We have no way of knowing which it is, so we need to use other techniques to find out. We'll cover that in a later video. In my definition of IQ samples, I assumed that the frequency was fixed. Let's explore what happens if we sample a signal with a different frequency. Say we've set the centre frequency of our SDR dongle to F1, but we're sampling a signal of frequency F2, which is F1 plus some change in frequency delta F. Let's call the signal F of t. For simplicity's sake, I'm assuming that the amplitude is constant and there's no phase term. We can expand the F2 term and rearrange. If we rename the term involving delta F to be phi of t, we can rewrite this in a familiar form. But hang on, we started with a signal that had no phase term, and now we've got one that's constantly changing. It seems that a signal of frequency f2 is the same as a signal of frequency f1, whose phase is constantly changing proportionally to delta f. On a constellation diagram, this would look like a point that's constantly rotating. This idea will be useful when we're trying to track GPS satellites as they move across the sky. The final thing I'll say about IQ samples is that they're often expressed as complex numbers, 
in this representation, I is, somewhat confusingly, the real component, and Q is the imaginary component. This convention will make things a little easier for us down the track, so let's adopt it. However, it does change our analysis of band pass sampling a little bit. We discussed before that if we choose our sampling rate carefully, the carrier wave can be replaced with a real valued constant. When we use complex IQ samples instead of real valued samples, the carrier wave is still replaced with a constant, but now it's complex valued. It turns out that the magnitude of this constant is equal to the amplitude of the carrier wave, and its argument is equal to the phase. Using Euler's formula, we can express this as a e to the j phi. So how does this affect the samples we receive? Well, the modulation signal is the product of the navigation message and the PRN code, both of which are equal to plus or minus one. So their product is equal to plus or minus one. When we multiply this by the complex constant z, the value is scaled by a factor of a as before, but multiplying it by e to the j phi rotates it through an angle phi in the complex plane. In other words, when we use complex IQ samples, performing bandpass sampling to replace the carrier wave with a constant results in the samples being scaled as before, but also rotated in the complex plane by the carrier wave's phase. Let's recap the important points from this video. First, in order to sample GPS signals, we need a GPS antenna and an SDR dongle. Second, we need to configure that hardware to use the parameters we derived. And finally, that hardware will give us IQ samples. These are pairs of numbers that describe the signal. They're often expressed as a single complex number. And if the signal's frequency differs from that of the SDR dongle, those complex numbers will continually rotate in the complex plane. In the next video, we'll cover the second stage of the GPS receiver implementation, acquisition. We'll determine what satellite signals we can hear and how to maximize their signal strength.